This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And for me, a gentle reminder, wherever your life's journey takes you, you will always have a home here with us. For those of you joining us uh, via live stream and computer, don't touch that dial. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your screen. I may be good looking, but I am not Campbell Lovett. <laughs> but rather, I'm Ted Tunnicliffe, and I'm sharing the greeting and announcements today. Announcers, uh, I invite you to gather here in the front pews as I share some thoughts and do some housekeeping. I want to welcome everyone to worship at the Congregational Church of Laconia, where ha we have been receiving sustenance for service since 1824. A special welcome to those worshiping via live stream. I hope that you will introduce yourselves to one another in the chat and share any prayer requests with our online greeter, Martha Clement. Uh, would the search committee come up and join me here, please, in the chancel area? all recognize this hard-working group of people, but I'm going to introduce them to you anyway. Uh, Lorraine Barrows, Jaylene Bengston, Diane Tinkham, Dave Eamon, Bob Hunt, John Intorcio, and Richard Bastille, who served as our chaplain and inspired us and prodded us and led us in prayer every meeting. Richard is unable to be here today as he's recovering from surgery, so we send him healing prayers and our best wishes for a speedy recovery. Did you write this? No. I wrote this. Okay. I've served on a number of committees here in this church, chaired some, and it has been my experience to date. No one has worked as hard as our search committee chair Kathy Giovanni. <laughs> I believe we elected her chairperson at our first meeting where she was not present. <laughs> <laughs> Serves her right. But she graciously accepted and for the past year has provided the guidance and direction needed by our committee. So we as a team and we as a church thank you, Kathy Giovanni. <laughs> and thank all of you as well. <laughs> I didn't do it alone. You had a little help. All right. um, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank um, Reverend Campbell Lovett for his many contributions to our committee and the search process. Although by convention he could not participate in our interviews or deliberation discussions, nor was he privy to the candidates' identities his help was invaluable early on with the composition of the church profile and other procedural matters, and we are grateful for all he has done to facilitate our work. Thank you. And that work to which I just referred has produced what we hope to be the next settled pastor of our church. I've been asked to keep introduction short, so I will. But let me share this. It seems there are a number of ministers who would like to assume the pulpit to my right and call this church home. We receive ministerial profiles from all over the country each was thoroughly reviewed and considered. Some of the candidates in our judgment were not a good fit for this church. Those who we felt would have a positive effect 
on the long-term health of this institution were interviewed via Zoom and references checked. As we narrowed the field, in-person interviews were conducted and more discussion and deliberations followed. Following those more intimate meetings, it became clear to the committee that the candidate we would propose to the executive committee and later to the church as a whole would be Reverend Eliza Tweedy. You all received a church mailing summarizing Eliza's education, theological background, and participation in church ministry. And I know a lot of you had an opportunity to chat with Eliza and her family yesterday at the reception downstairs and hope it was a positive experience for all. So it is with great pleasure I introduce to you the Reverend Eliza Tweedy. Eliza has brought her familial support team with her, and I'm pleased to introduce her wife, Beatrice. <laughs> and, their, and their boys, Asa and Eli. <laughs> Big sister Melina is attending college and was not able to join us here this morning. Would you like to be seated? I will. You want? Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> uh, some sad news to share with you this morning. Uh, Jack Weeks has died. Mm. Jack Weeks may be known to all of, well, all the old timers um, as the proprietor of Weeks Dairy here in Laconia in Concord. Uh, he died on his birthday on Thursday, December 7th. And services for Jack are going to be here at the church on Saturday, December 16th. Uh, the exact time uh, has yet to be determined, uh, but we extend our seer, sincere sympathies to Pat and the Weeks family in their time of loss. Are there other announcements this morning? Dan? First of all, a pastor wearing high heel sparkly shoes. I mean, come on, this is, this is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, as chair of the nominating committee, it's, I have this image of a jigsaw puzzle almost done, and there are only those few pieces left, and, and it looks like they're easy pieces to fill in, but it's not complete yet. So if you would like to uh, help fill in the last missing pieces of this jigsaw puzzle in this very exciting year. Please talk to me about an opportunity to serve on a committee in this church. Thanks. Morning, Dan Tinkham from Outreach. I want to bring to your attention a, the fourth special offering of the year offered by the United Church of Christ. This is called the Christmas Fund, or the older term, Veterans of the Cross. Um, not to be confused with the Christmas card. Both very worthy uh, considerations for you. Uh, the Christmas card uh, going to Horton Center Camperships. And the Christmas fund is largely used for retired pastors and their wives and family who have, um, by following their calling, they have had financial stresses in their retirement fund over the years. So uh, that's the case for many retired pastors. Um, this fund helps just keep in touch with the retired pastors of the UCC and uh, give them a small gift at times or uh, help them in uh, emergency times when medical bills or whatever uh, become too much. So please consider uh, the Christmas fund for United Church of Christ. Hi, I'm Don Dupac, and I have an opportunity, another opportunity. Um, I have been charged with arranging altar flowers in the month of January, and I have an opportunity for the first Sunday in January so if anyone would like to um, donate flowers, please contact me. I'm in the directory, and um, I'm here in church most Sundays. So thank you. Good morning, Wayne Doman. Uh, this is just a, a technical reminder, an attempt to get as many of our membership involved 
in a special congregational meeting. I just want them, if any of you go home, but I'd rather that you stay. But there, the Zoom link for the meeting is in only one place, and that is in the news blast that came out to all of us on Friday. And then there is a passcode. So just for those folks who uh, are on a different platform right now watching this meeting, those members will then have to switch over and come Zooming into our congregational meeting, which will begin at 1045. That way they can participate and they can vote. Thank you. Good morning, my name's Don Clark. And um, I'm letting people know that if they wanted to make a donation to the church Christmas card, uh, there's a tree in the foyer there that you can uh, put a bulb in the, on the tree and make a monetary donation. To, and the proceeds of the church Christmas card go to Horton Center uh, attendees for the summer season. So I'll be out there after church today. Does anyone else have anything to offer in the good of the order? Are we all set? Uh, as Wayne indicated uh, just a moment ago, a special meeting in the congregation will be held following the worship service this morning. We're looking forward to a positive result and to formally call Eliza as the next pastor and teacher of this church. You will see several announcements printed in your bulletin. I commend to all the Christmas updates about poinsettias, caroling, offerings, and Christmas Eve. Let us now begin the candle lighting liturgy. Diane, Jaylene. Too often, O oh God, we hear the drumbeats of war, the unremitting reasons to be fearful and suspicious. We hear the loud voices of hatred and despair. And so we light these candles in faith that another way is possible. Open our hearts, we pray, that we may hear the calm reassurance of the peacemakers. Open our hearts to the words and deeds of grace until we can respond in compassion when faced with hate, until we can respond in peaceful justice when faced with violence, until we can respond with calm faith in you when faced with the relentlessness calls of fear. Make us instruments of your peace, O holy God, who made all humanity in your own image.
I invite you all to stand as you are comfortable in body or in spirit for the singing of our first hymn, number 101, Comfort, O My People. morning. Please join me in the prayer of Together that's in your bulletin. Holy One, pour out your peace upon us, we pray. Hold us fast in the peace that does not look away from sorrow, but which gives us the courage to love in the face of grief. For we remember that your presence among us can change not only our individual lives, but the world. May your peace be the calm in our hearts and the love that flows from us into all the world. And now please join me in the prayer of our Savior, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to pass the peace of the people with greetings and um, however you're comfortable as far as peace sign or fist bump or you know, shake hands, whatever you feel like is appropriate for you. So let's pass the peace to each other.
The scripture reading today is Isaiah 40, 1 through 11, and it should feel very familiar, especially if we've been studying along with our Handel scriptures that we've, uh, we've been um, enjoying on Thursday nights. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and her penalty is paid that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their const constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lamb in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. Will you join with me, please, in a moment of prayer? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Alleluia. Amen. Today, we light the second of our Advent candles. Well, it didn't seem to want to light terribly well. And in the grand scheme of things, two little sparks of light don't seem to do a whole lot. I think if we were to turn off the rest of the lights in here, it wouldn't allow you to read your bulletins, for example. One spark feels appropriate for last week's hope, that one tenacious little flame that holds on despite everything. But for the next step to be peace, well, it feels like a little bit of a leap, doesn't it? That's not the obvious next step. What even is peace? <laughs> There's a hard one. The other candles of Advent hope and joy and love, I think we have more general experience at those, don't we? But what about peace? What would it look like? What would it feel like to live in peace? <laughs> Is it to turn on the news and see no stories of war or violence? Is it the times when we can set aside the world for a little bit? Is it skating on a pond in the still silence of winter or sitting by a fire all cozy and warm in those moments when you feel like nothing else can touch you? Often conversations around peace are abstract, it being one of those things that most of us haven't really lived. Peace is a concept 
It's a lack of something that we know all too well, especially in these days. Or it's something very individual, very local. It's about feeling ease in our own hearts, that sense of being able to relax, feeling safe and comfortable within our own lives. This time of year, I tend to reread or rewatch a Christmas carol. I'm, I'm not the only one, right? <laughs> Christmas carol, yes? OK, cool, cool. We can debate our favorites downstairs. And I will watch any of them, honestly. There's just something hopeful about watching a hardened, bitter person be broken all the way open and begin to shift his life toward justice and love. But I always wonder, as I finish the book or as I turn off the movie, about that happy ending. I wonder what happens after Christmas Day, where Scrooge sent a turkey off to the Cratchits, where he greeted all his neighbors with good humor, made a donation to charity for the first time possibly in his life, and accepted his nephew's invitation to dinner. I wonder about the happy ending after the Boxing Day, where he made Bob Cratchit think he would be fired, only to turn it around and surprise him with kindness and a substantial raise. I wonder. Because as much as we love stories like this one, where a person can be changed in one day, and they all live happily ever after, reality tends to be a bit more complicated. And I wonder if the peace that Scrooge discovered, that shift in his heart from the personal security of wealth to the grace and mercy that eased the way for all around him, I wonder if that felt comfortable to him in those first weeks. Indeed, I wonder how much ease any of them felt around him for a long while after that Christmas day, as they all of them learned to live in the true peace that is bigger than any one of us. It is a particularly poignant story when read in conjunction with today's passage in Isaiah. And this is the pastor and teacher part of it. This is the teacher hat on. Here in chapter 40, we are at a huge turning point in this prophetic work. It's the longest book of the Bible. Up to now, the first 39 chapters have laid out some pretty hellfire and brimstone passages. Some of my favorites in the Bible, frankly, they're really pretty great. This is a story of a people who are so sure of their position as God's chosen ones that they have become arrogant. They see God's love and grace as a get-out-of-jail-free card Forgiveness for all their sins without having to do any of the work of loving their neighbors or being accountable for their harmful actions. The first entire third, and more, of Isaiah is the story of the prophet trying to call the people, especially the comfortable people, the well-fed, well-housed, powerful people, back into a covenant that tends not to anyone's individual ease or security, but to the health and well-being of an entire community that acknowledges the particular plights of the most vulnerable and the calls to the people to prioritize community care before self-care. Spoilers, it ends badly. The leadership of Israel and Judah put more faith in their own political machinations. They see their own power and security as signs of God's blessing, and so they get their itty-bitty kingdoms evolved in the affairs of the gigantically huge empires that are all around them, and the inevitable happens. They get swallowed up, invaded, and occupied twice. No wonder Isaiah uses colorful language all the way through. But then you get to chapter 40. There's a gap between the end of 39 and the beginning of 40. It doesn't, you don't notice it in the Bible, obviously, page turn. But chapter 40 begins as the era of occupation and eventual exile comes to an end. They didn't write that chunk of Isaiah while they were in exile, obviously. So they picked it back up. 
as the formerly arrogant leadership begin to pick up the pieces of their shattered individualism. And according to the prophet, the very first thing they hear is comfort. Comfort. The way back will be made straight, the rough places plain, as they return to the places where they once ruled and where their families held such power. But it is not a comfort like the one that they had known before. The comfort of wealth and status that kept them from actually having, ever having to deal with the unpleasant realities of their vulnerable neighbors. Indeed, the Hebrew word translated here as comfort holds, according to Duke professor Anathea Portier Young, a meaning closer to reversal or change of heart or that, you know, church word there, repentance. Comfort, my people, says God through Isaiah to the ancients and to us. You, you have made some mistakes. And the consequences were painful. Violence and war. Suspicion and anxiety, so normal we scarcely even see them anymore and just accept them as the hills and the valleys and the crooked paths that stretch before us. But the covenant remains, made real in our care for community. The chance for peace remains, the true peace which is not the individual avoidance of violence by deterrence and isolation, but is the nurturing of communities such that violence and fear and anger fade in the presence of love and understanding. Scrooge's repentance comes after a hard night of bearing witness to deep truths of his own life and the lives of those around him, of the impact of his own predatory individualistic way of existing in the world, making his fortune off of the poverty of the vulnerable. The visits of the ghosts having forced him to open his eyes and ears in ways that he had not done before. And I think we like to hear this story as one that finds Scrooge comfortable in new and renewed relationship a better man the city of London had never known. But, you know. but I wonder if someone like Scrooge would feel himself at ease for a long time after that night of revelation. I wonder how comfortable he felt as he got to actually know the Cratchits, who had lived their lives in poverty and dependence, prey to employers, Scrooge, and landlords, also Scrooge, and bill collectors, I wonder how safe he felt in meeting Mrs. Cratchit in particular, who had drunk his health with such ill will, bitter towards one who had made her husband's life so unhappy. Was she willing to accept his repentance at face value without seeing just exactly how open his eyes and ears had become? Hmm. I wonder how comfortable he felt faced with those whose mortgages he held faced with those whose eviction notices he had signed, faced with all of those who had been hurt by him as his years and his years of predatory living. I wonder how safe he felt when the power that he wielded no longer served as a shield, when his repentance made him vulnerable before the fear and anger of those whose lives had been damaged by his heartlessness. I wonder how comfortable, how safe, the ancient people felt as they set out from exile back into the places where they had had and abused power, as they prepared themselves to face those who had been hurt by actions and inactions that society had long considered normal, despite the prophet's frequent warnings. I wonder how comfortable we feel as we hear our modern prophets, our Christmas spirits in our own lives, holding up our own societal accountings before us, calling us to comfort, calling us to repentance, calling us to change our own hearts in the reassurance of God's presence and accompaniment and comfort as we move toward a covenantal reality 
a vision of peace that speaks less and less to our individual sense of security than to the promises of care set before all of creation together. The way is made straight before us. The rough places plain by God's presence and by our response to it. It is the result of righteousness, of wisdom to see beyond ourselves and the ability to stand in awe before our God, lived out in a way that makes repentance visible, lived out in a way that promotes justice for the marginalized, lived out in a way that makes the powerful vulnerable and the powerless lose their fear, lived out in a way that creates trust and just relationship between all members of God's creation. And this, this vision of peace, is not one that is going to bring a whole lot of ease or security in the short term, as Scrooge quite likely found out. This vision of peace as being the end result of justice and equity that turns the world upside down in ways that are more likely to, feel, to make us feel uncomfortably vulnerable than to make us feel at ease inside. Which, all of it, might be enough to make us want to get up and blow out this Advent candle, go home and watch a Christmas carol, preferably the Muppets with the hilarity of Fozzie Wig's Rubber Chicken Factory? and bask in the happy ending of Muppets and humans alike sitting around a miraculously roasted turkey. Did y'all ever catch that? It took like five minutes. Because the alternative is, frankly, overwhelming. The discomfort of a just peace, which is more important than our comfortable notions of individual security. It is hard to envision a path forward, however smooth it may be, that's going to turn our entire world upside down. Individualism and com competition, that's what we know after all. And we're pretty okay most of the time with simply managing whom we should fear at any given moment. Right up until we read Isaiah. Because Isaiah's vision cuts down our very lives right before our eyes, demands not only justice but righteousness and repentance and vulnerability and peace for the sake of all creation intertwined and interdependent for whom the paths can still be made straight. It's enough to make you want to give up. I get that. But if Ebenezer Scrooge can be reborn, then who among us cannot? If the elites from our scripture reading can know the comfort that was changing their hearts and the move from individual ease to communal peace and the presence of God throughout the return and rebuilding, who are we to say that we cannot walk with them, confident in that same grace and in that same covenant that straightened and leveled and smoothed the path that had at first seemed overwhelmingly hard? Can we not trust the true peace that comes when we can make the shift from an ease that is the absence of violence to the peace that is our determination to love even in the face of fear? When we open ourselves to understand the anger of a Mrs. Cratchit, the terror of an impoverished mortgage holder, the hope of a nephew long rebuffed. When we hold their stories to be every bit as sacred as our own, Indeed, when we hold their stories as our own, heartbreak and all, and are made new within them. Like for Ebenezer, there may be a complicated story to tell after that initial moment of repentance. But we trust in the peace that requires only a little spark to begin to make the rough places plain. We trust in the peace that is the beginning of a world that God still dreams, not just for any one of us, but for the world that can yet be formed, the path that can yet be made when we turn our hearts to the good of the community, the needs of a creation that together bears the image of God, embodies the incarnation, the God-made flesh that is, again, coming into this world. Like those to whom Isaiah spoke, we know the same comfort that changes our hearts, 
the lasting peace that emerges in the hard work of covenantal relationships that keep us all in honest vulnerability one with another in the embodied love of a God that doesn't see as we do, in the suspicion of us versus them, the competitive anxiety and the violent deterrence. But when we see through the eyes of a God who calls us to the comfort of a heart that moves toward a reality of mercy and grace, we live in the love that continually calls us into relationship with those whom God loves, and therefore with God's own self, in whom we find comfort and the peace of God's abiding. And for all of that, we give God all thanks and praise. Alleluia. Amen. I'm sure there are some prayer requests coming in from those who are, who are joining online this morning, and I am so grateful for those. But I would like to offer up to see if there are any prayer requests. Thank you so much. Any prayer requests in the room as well? There are uh, Dave and Bob who have microphones, and our online prayer this morning is for Linda, who is battling kidney cancer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yes, please. I thank you very much for prayers for my son, Daniel. Um, he continues to improve. Um, I also ask for continued prayers for my sister-in-law, Donna, who has um, cancer, and it is spreading, and she is looking for a miracle, mm -hmm. as am I. Thank you very much. Holy God, in your mercy. So I'd offer a prayer for Bridget, who's in the hospital, and um, we've been praying for her. She's getting better, and, and also for my brother-in-law, Richard, healing prayers. Holy God, in your mercy. I have um, some good news for you guys. I got a promotion at work, and I'm also now making 1060 an hour at my job, and I want to continue on prayers for my coworker, Marie. Her husband is doing good. His surgery was a success. And my coworker, Tim, um, his grandson was able to move his hands. Um, and so he is doing well, but continue on prayers for both. Holy God, in your mercy. Hear prayers of gratitude for the opportunity to have been involved in the children's auction for the last 39 years, I guess. Um, and for this year in particular, uh, this is just an amazing mass of people who come with the same heart and the same spirit, and they represent the late trees and they represent this church, and there are many of you who have been a part of that as well. So just uh, another wonderful, wonderful year, and that money is going to do great things, and for that I am grateful. Holy God, in your mercy. I'd like to wish um, happy Hanukkah to the Jewish side of my family and friends and neighbors, and wish for peace in Gaza for the Palestinians and the Israelis. I know the area very well. I worked on a kibbutz there for six months right after college, and they were fighting then, 50 years ago. So peace in Ukraine, too. Holy God, in your mercy. I'd like to ask, is it on? Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask for prayers, peace and hope for all people suffering with mental issues during this holiday time. Holy God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Can you 
speak into the microphone so that everybody who's joining us online can hear you also. We want to make sure the whole congregation can hear you. I, am a, I apologize, and I know my voice doesn't carry that well, so thank you for the mic. I just wanted to take a moment to thank the Deaconate for the lovely quilt and uh, gift we received yesterday, along with a generous amount of goodies that we will be sharing with Belknap House. Thank you. Holy God, in your mercy. Let us take all that has been spoken and all that remains upon our hearts and lift it up to God. Holy One, we thank you for the ability to bring before you all that is upon our hearts. For those who are struggling, for those who are suffering, we hold their stories as our own. For those who rejoice this day, for those who have borne witness to miracles, we hold their joy as our own. For by our prayers we are united in one body in Christ Jesus. We make real again the incarnation that is coming into this world that was and is and is to come. And we give thanks to you for your constant abiding, for your holy accompaniment and your presence throughout all of the ups and downs, joys and concerns, the many faceted prayers of our lives. For you are our God, wherever we are in our own lives, wherever we are in community, and we are your people, now and forever. Thanks be to you, almighty God. Alleluia. Amen. We lift up our prayers not only to be joined in one body of Christ, but as a way of remembering the wider community that is around us. And it is in the way that we respond to this community, it is in the way that we respond to God's presence in all of our lives, that we give thanks most clearly. This morning's offering will now be received.
source of all, we bring our gifts before you in gratitude for all that we have received. You have poured out your grace upon us, and we respond in generosity to all that shares your holy image. Bless, therefore, we pray, the offerings of our hands and our hearts. May all that we say and all that we do be for the sake of your promised kingdom of peace and mercy. Amen. And now let us sing together our closing hymn number 120, There's a Voice in the Wilderness. be seated. I always feel a little awkward doing a benediction when there's a meeting that's going to go on ahead, although I won't be at that, obviously, um, because the meeting itself continues our acknowledgement of God's presence among us. So I leave you with this. Peace is a difficult concept, but we find it when we gather in places like this. We find it within our own hearts and with the gathered body, so many varied people from so many different places gathered to be one church together. So go out into this world, go on into this meeting, assured of God's presence where two or more are gathered and knowing that the peace of Christ is there as well. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm -hmm.